Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Anything and Everything, the show which acknowledges that everyone has a story. I'm your host and producer, Halima Sharif. I'm excited once again to bring you another segment of our New Orleans Music Legends series, where we have had amazing conversations with Edward Kidd Jordan and his daughter, Rachel, Jermaine Basil, Victor Goins, Donald Harrison Jr., Nicholas Payton, Pearl and Riley, Shannon Powell, and now this evening we have Mr. James Andrews. Welcome, James. Thank you. How are you? I'm doing just fine, man. So good to have you here. Thank you for joining us this evening. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. So I want to allow me to take a moment to tell everyone a little something about James Andrews before we get started. James Andrews hails from a legendary musical family out of New Orleans. He is the grandson of Jesse Hill, older brother and mentor to Troy Andrews, better known by his stage name as Trombone Shorty, and cousin to Glenn David Andrews and the late Travis Trumpet Black Hill. A trumpeter and vocalist, James has the nickname Satchmo of the Ghetto. Raised in Treme neighborhood, James played in the number of brass bands, including the Treme Brass Band, Junior Olympia Brass Band, and the New Birth Brass Band before launching his own band, James Andrews and the Crescent City All-Stars. He also played with multi-instrumentalist Danny Barker. In 1998, he released the album Satchmo of the Ghetto, which was produced by Alan Toussaint and featured Dr. John on all 11 tracks. In 2005, shortly after Hurricane Katrina, James was one of the first musicians to return to New Orleans following the flood. He and his brothers Trombone Shorty played at Jackson Square a mere 17 days after Katrina hit the area. And at a later show at the New Orleans Jazz National Historical Park, James was the first to declare, we're gonna rebuild this city note by note. James appeared as himself in three episodes of the HBO series Treme, Do What You Wanna, Smoke My Peace Pipe, and yes, we can, can. Welcome again, Brother James Andrews. I'm so great, so happy to have you here. Thank yeah. you for joining us. It's a New Orleans thing. Oh, yes, it is, man. I miss my New Orleans. Yeah, you got to come back home. Oh, I will. I definitely will. Yes. So, you know, James, you, you have an amazing history as it relates to your musical journey in New Orleans, the Treme, and more so your family's influence. Can you break down your family's musical lineage, past to present, oldest to youngest? Take us on that historical journey. Well, my great great my great grandfather was Walter Walter Nelson, and he played guitar with Smiley Lewis and Fats Domino. He played with Papa Celestine and all the older uh, generation of uh, New Orleans musicians. And his sons played with Fats Domino. His son was Walter Papoose Nelson. And his, he played with Fats Domino and Smiley Lewis too. And his other son was Prince Lala. And he wrote a song called You Put the Hurt On Me. And that's my grandmother brothers. And, and uh, they, they played with Harold Baptiste and, uh, and all uh, John Boudreau and uh, Chuck Beatty and all of those guys. And mm -hmm. that's my grandmother brothers. And then we have uh, my cousins who play music. Like you said, we have Glenn David Andrews we have uh we had trumpet black who was a trumpet player and he was a uh, Travis trumpet black hero and he played the trumpet and we have so many other cousins revert andrews who played the trombone he played with rebert and dirty dozen and we have glenn andrews he played with rebert and wrote many songs for rebert mm -hmm. and we have uh we have so many young uh, more family members we have another drummer glenn buddha andrews who plays the drums now and we have my son, Jannard, who plays the drums with his band called the New Breeze Brass Band. And we have my brother, Trombone Shorty, and he have a son named Hassan, who is playing our drums with the TBC Brass Band. Man. And that's... we have so many, uh, we have Trombone Shorty when he was just uh, four years old playing, playing all over, the, all over New Orleans and we took him out to play at festivals around the world. We traveled to Cuba, we traveled to Dubai, Kuwait, we traveled to Europe, we played in France, we played so many festivals around the world when he was a kid. We've been to Turkey, we've been to uh, so many places to play in Europe when he was a kid. 
man, you did some touring. I mean, the entire family, that, that's a very rich legacy, you know, with your grandfather and, you know, the siblings. Yeah, and my, grandfather wrote the, my grandfather wrote the hit song called Ooh Poop a Doo. It was right. a hit in 1960-something. You know, um, I recently interviewed Herlin Riley, and, he, and I didn't realize y'all were related. You know? Yeah, that's my cousin, yeah. Yeah, man, and he mentioned about Oop Oop Adu, and I'm like, man, these songs bring back so many memories of yeah. me growing up in New Orleans and just being so connected to all these wonderful musical families like yours, you know? Yes, and your well, family too. Oh yeah, definitely, it's, it's, it's a blessing. So yeah. how did you get started on the trumpet? I mean, considering you got trombone, drums, who, who were some trumpeters that inspired and influenced you? Well, when I first started out, I started out in uh, in the French Quarter tap dancing and shining shoes. And then I started playing the drums, uh, the bass drum with Danny Barker, put a band together with young people. And we played in that band called The Roots of Jazz with Danny Barker. But I was playing the trumpet all the time. Mm -hmm. Even when I was in elementary school, I played the trumpet when I was going to Craig School. And then I played the trumpet uh, we started a band called the All-Star Brass Band, and Nicholas Payton was a member of that band we started so many years ago. And so I always loved the trumpet, and I always loved the, the look at, the watch the uh, trumpet players from back then. The leader of the band was the trumpet players back then. And so I watched people like Wallace Davenport. Mm -hmm. I watched people like uh, Percy Humphrey. I watched people like... Uh, I watched your dad, of course. I watched Cl uh, Clyde Kerr play. I watched uh, Milton Baptiste from the Olympia Brass Band play. And I watched so many people from the Preservation Hall play. Dave Bartholomew, I watched him. I watched so many great trumpet players from New Orleans back then. So it, you you were just mesmerized by the trumpet yeah i was by them by them guys and the way they played and the way they they was leading the band so i always i always liked that about them wow you know i got a question for you why yeah. did they call you 12. oh they, they called me little 12 <laughs> little 12 because my dad was a uh used to gamble and play dice okay and his numbers were 12. And so everybody used to call him 12. And so when I used to go around with him, they called me Lil 12. Makes a whole lot of sense, man. You know, those, yeah. those nicknames uh, bring back so many fond memories. You know, a lot of times we have so many nicknames in our communities that you forget what the person's real name is. Absolutely. But, Sometimes we know the people's nickname and don't know his real name in New Orleans. I know, Orleans. but it's the beauty of it, you know? Yeah. James, share some of your childhood memories. Um, in particular, some of those fondest me memories of being in the Treme and the second line culture in general. Oh, it was always, when we was in the Treme, it was always, when we was growing up, it was always some kind of music around in the Treme and it was always a second line, a parade or a jazz funeral passing in front of our house, always in the Treme with the mm -hmm. Money Waster Social and Pledge Club and the Treme Sports. Social and Pleasure Clubs was based out of the Treme back then. And it was, you can hear the band playing and you know they was coming down the street. And so that's the childhood memories I have of uh, running outside the door and joining in the second line when I was young that was coming down the street, a funeral or a parade was coming down the street with the Olympia band. It was always something. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, you know, a lot of folks can't say they have had the opportunity to experience what you have experienced and, you know, just... Yeah, and growing up right right by Armstrong Park, too. And we was living in Armstrong Park when they tore down the houses and made room for the park. And so mm -hmm. my whole family come from that part of Treme, Armstrong Park, and they had a ballroom was called the Caledonia. Yeah, and yeah. my grandmother and all of them used to hang out at that bar. Yeah, and that was on St. Philip Street. And so I have memories of the the jazz funerals and the old time musicians and uh, so many things and many memories of uh, going from the Treme and going to the French Quarter to tap dance for tips in the French Quarter and dancing for the tourists. I have many memories of that. Speaking of Armstrong Park, you know, I know you have uh, 
a great admiration for Satchmo. And oh, yeah. It's, it's quite understood. Um, yeah. Could you share with us what intrigues you about Louis Armstrong? The thing that got me about Louis Armstrong was that big personality, that New Orleans personality he had with him, and he took it everywhere he went in the world. That personality from New Orleans, and he was, uh, and his entertainment style he had, that charisma of his own, and the way he played the trumpet as well, and the way he sung, and I just like the way he interact with the people and treat the people was around him. It was a real down home New Orleans man. And you can see that and you can hear that in his style and everything he done was New Orleans. He always mentioned the red beans and rice. That's what he wanted. And he talked about New Orleans the whole time. And it was just that whole thing that got me. And when I heard his trumpet and I start listening to his, him sing and scat, Mm -hmm. And it was just that whole thing about Louis Armstrong, and it, it, it's, it's the connection between New Orleans and him. And he took it everywhere he went, and he made it the best. And that's what I liked about him. Well, you know what? I can say, um, hearing you speak so fondly of, of Louis Armstrong, and then knowing you personally, and, and watching your career, I can see the influence. I mean, you love your city, you love your culture, you love our people. Um, you love what you do, and you have that joyful, that jovial spirit as well. So a lot of that has rubbed off on you. It's like his spirit is living in you. Yes, uh, ambassador of New Orleans. That's right. You exact. You can say that again. You surely are. <laughs> yeah, and we're and in New Orleans, we are we are we are people who like to enjoy life, and we right. and we celebrate life through our music and and through our family and friends, and we. We bring that feeling all over the world, everywhere we go. And New Orleans music is well respected for the good time of this city. And when I say I'm from New Orleans all over the world, the people celebrate and it's a celebration. They say, oh, good old New Orleans. And they know that feeling and that New Orleans is a, it's a celebration. It is, it is James, it's a, it's a celebration. And you know, when I think more about the second line culture, yeah. and even the jazz funerals, um, you know, we celebrate life even when life is no longer here. Yeah. Um, we just take it to another level. So you're right about that on, on multiple levels. Um, yeah. I, want you to, I want you to tell me the story about your all-star brass band and the different musicians who played with you in that band. Oh, yeah. We had the all-star brass band. We, had, we started out playing in Jackson Square. Mm -hmm. And we, had, um, we started out kids. <clears throat> playing in Jackson Square, and we would go out there every day, and people would see us and, and, and hire us to play other gigs, and we played at the New Orleans World's Fair with that band, and we played in a, a place called uh, Ascona, Switzerland. Mm -hmm. We went over there many years ago, and we, was, uh, we recorded some music, and we took it over there, and we sold it. It was cassettes. They didn't have CDs then. It was on the cassette. And so we took a uh, thousand cassettes over there and we sold them all to the Swiss people over there. And we was, uh, we had uh, Sammy Remington Jr. who is the son of Nina Buck and Sammy Remington. And he played the clarinet and saxophone with us. And we had Mark Jolly on the trombone. We had my brother Terry Nelson was on the snare drum. We had Joan Gaddis on the bass drum. And we had Nicholas Payton on the other trumpet me and him was the trumpet players, and we had uh, we had a couple of more people. We had Kerwin James, who was the brother of the Rebirth Brass Band, and he died a few years ago after Katrina, mm -hmm. and he was our tuba player. And so we took that band all over Europe when we was kids. We played uh, we played in Milan, Italy. Our first time leaving New Orleans was flying to New York, then to Milan, Italy, and we played at a festival in Milan, Italy, and that was our first trip ever leave in New Orleans. Wow, what year was that? That was, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, that was in 19, that was about 1985 or something like that. Wow. After the World's Fair. Mm -hmm. That's right, the World's Fair was in 1984. 1984, yeah. You, um, you mentioned Nicholas Payton earlier, and um, I mentioned earlier that I interviewed Nicholas and I also interviewed Shannon, um, and uh, they, like many others, spoke fondly of Don Danny Barker's influence on their lives. Um, 
and the significance of the brass bands. Talk about the influence um, Mr. Barker had on you, and then also yeah. the significance of the brass bands of New Orleans. Yeah, Mr. Barker was a big influence on me because Mr. Barker was a friend of my dad and my mm -hmm. mama. And so Mr. Barker used to come out by my house and sit in front of the house, or he used to come in, and he used to talk with my mom and dad. And one day he'd say he was starting a band with some kids, and he wanted us to come over to the rehearsal. And so me and my brother went over to the rehearsal down by Hunters Field, Tambourine and Fan. We used to rehearse there. Mm -hmm. And so we started out playing the drums in that band with Danny Barker. And uh, and Danny Barker was, uh, and then we used to have a bar called La Trombone Shorty. Years later, we named, after my little brother, was a bar room down in the Trimmy. And Danny Barker used to come and sit in front of the bar. And your dad used to come over to the bar and talk with me all the time. He used to come in the morning and there used to be a, uh, me, him, and Harry Nance used to be talking for hours. They used to be mm -hmm. talking about the time stuff. And so Danny Barker was a big influence. He lived in New York for so many years. And he came back home to New Orleans to revive the, the brass band scene because it was dying. They only had like uh, one or two bands left, was playing the second lines, and it was the Olympia Brass Band. And so Danny Barker came back home, and he revived the whole brass band scene and he got people like Leroy Jones and Greg Stafford and Tuba Fats and all of those guys when they was young and uh, Gregory Davis from the Dirty Dozen. And he put a band together with all them kids when they was kids and he revived the brass band scene through them. And then each one of them let out and did something on their own and, and started bands. And so the brass band, uh, brass band culture came back to life through that. And then you had people like Rebert that followed in the Dirty Dozen uh, footsteps. And then, and then you had our band, the All-Star Brass Band. And now today we have many bands that young, young people saw that. And now we have New Orleans music and second line culture. It's, it's driving and it's alive. It surely is driving it alive. And I mean, not, not just in New Orleans, the influence it's of everywhere. the brass influence band. Everywhere. Is everywhere. Yeah, that's, that's right. We have influenced so many other um, cultures and other other countries. Yeah, you know, the states is is phenomenal. And you know, the people you know, trying to play the music just like we play it right here in New Orleans. Yeah, when right. I go over there, I was I'd be surprised when I go over there and the bands over there they know all my music. I just gotta uh -huh. go up and play. They already know the parts, and I'd be I'd be like, wow. And it's like. And I'd say to myself, if they only know what we do in New Orleans. Oh, yeah, they, man. It's all <laughs> over. <laughs> we come it's from with, and what this means to so many in New Orleans. That's right. It's a, it's a, listen, it's a special beat, special flavor, special everything, you know. Absolutely. How many albums have you done or recorded oh, on? I guess that's, uh, a, that's a heck of a question to ask. No, no, uh, that's a good question because I have about, uh, ooh, I might have about 15 of them. Wow. Yeah. When when was your first album? Oh, uh, my first album by myself was the Satchmo Together was produced by Alan Toussaint and Dr. John played on uh all of the tracks with me. So that was my debut album by myself. But I recorded so many stuff with so many people and uh my first thing was Satchmo Together with Alan Toussaint produced. Mm -hmm. And I got a chance to write some songs myself. That's beautiful. Yeah. What was what would you say your most popular album was? Uh, it's probably gonna be the Satchmo Together because when it came out, we worked and we we still working today off that that Sam album. So that would be it. That's beautiful, man. Yeah. You know. Um, and we have a so and we have a I have an album with me and my brother uh, Troy Trombone Shorty, and it's called Twelve and Shorty. Oh, and we wow. have the John playing on that album too on every song. And we have a guy on the drums named Stanton Moore from Galactic. And we have Mark Brooks on the bass and Dr. John on the piano. And so we have a song off that album called The Zulu King. And they play that every Mardi Gras time here in New Orleans for the Zulu Social and Pleasure Club. Yes, indeed. When, when did y'all do that? We did that a few years before Katrina, probably a year before Katrina. And that was oh. 2000. Wow. 
Man, that's a lot of history. Yeah. Uh, you know, I know folks yeah, ask you this. Too. What's that you say? I have many, we have many more stuff, a lot of more stuff too. I know, I'm sure you got a lot of more stuff coming too. Yeah, I have many stuff coming, yeah. Yeah. So, you we know. We're working on it. We, uh, we got some stuff we're getting ready to put out with a label from Canada. And we got, man, some other stuff we're going to do too. Yeah. Oh, man, I can't wait to hear about that. Yeah. You know, I know folks ask you this all the time, and, and so now I'm going to ask you, talk, talk to us about the early beginnings of your little brother, Trombone Shorty. Oh, yeah. Well, when he was, first time we took him somewhere was in Phoenix, Arizona. He was about five, and we took him to Phoenix, Arizona to play at the Scottsdale Jazz Festival. Mm. And we took him to, uh, we went to San Francisco to do a thing with Wynton Marcellus on a thing he was doing called the Bourbon Street Parade video. And me and Troy is dancing in his video at a place called the Great American Music Hall. And Herlin is playing the drums on that. And so Troy, uh, when he come up, he did some of the same stuff. He tap danced a little while in the French Quarter. And he had a band he had started called the Five O'Clock Band, the Four O'Clock Band. And that was all kids. And they used to play in Jackson Square and all over Bourbon Street. And then, I started taking him more and more with me. We, I took him to Havana, Cuba for the festival mm -hmm. and took him over to Europe and we played at many festivals. We played at, in France at a festival called Toulouse. And so we took him all over. He was always around music. And we all, at that time we had always had instruments laying around the house. When we come back from the French Quarter, we'll leave the uh, instruments on the living room floor and when we get back, Troy will be crawling, playing around every instrument in the, that we had. He was in him. You know, he was yeah. exposed to it since he was a little baby. You know? Yeah. Wow, man. He, that's, that's he, he bone with it. He literally bone with it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. No, literally. All y'all were, pretty, for the most part. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But he was, he was really bone with it because we used to have a station wagon back then for the band. And he used to be in the back of the station wagon playing with the tuba, playing with the drums, playing with the trombone. He was always playing with something. Yeah. Every time we was, we was, uh, we was, we just got back from playing in the French Quarter and Tuba Fats. Tuba Fats used to live upstairs at a place we had, we used to call a shop. And mm -hmm. Tuba Fats used to leave this tuba downstairs where we used to rehearse. We had our own rehearsal place. We used to barbecue all the time, and we all the musicians used to come over there. And so Troy used to be a playing around there. One day he got his baby bottle and the pamper stuck in tuba fat tuba, <laughs> and tuba fat, <laughs> and tuba fat ain't no problem. When he turned the tuba over, he had a baby diaper and he had a a baby bottle filled up with milk inside his tuba. And he said, "Oh, trombone did it. Troy put that in my tuba." And one time I remember some kind of way he got a hold of Tuba Fat Tuba mouthpiece and went hit it somewhere. And for Tuba Fat had to play at the Preservation Hall, Tuba Fat was, he was begging Troy, oh, please, baby, go find that for me. I'm going to give you $20. <laughs> oh, that's funny, man. That's hilarious. <laughs> oh, there's always something man. around the house. How, how old was he at that time, James? He was about two years old at that he time. May even, he may not even remember all that stuff, of course. No, no, he, was, he couldn't even walk then. He was in the stroller. Oh, man, that's funny. Yeah, and so when we christened him, we did a, we christened him at a Baptist church in the Seven Ward. Mm -hmm. so we had a, he had his little white on and all that. When he, we christened him, he wasn't even walking. He was in the stroller. And so we had a big sack of line come from the church Oh, we did it big for his christening. And there was so many musicians came out, you would have thought it was an old time musician who was getting christened. <laughs> but it was a little baby getting christened. Oh, baby, man, that's funny. So you know, right then and there, he had an impact at a very young age. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It, was, it was his destiny to be a musician. Yeah, it was, it was. And I think yeah. it's so beautiful when I hear these stories, you know, um, the exposure and just being able to, grow up in a family of such wonderful musicians. You know, I, I just yeah. love it. Um, you know, I, I want to ask you the question about 
unsung heroes, and I've asked this before, but it's always good to hear others. So who would you say um, are some unsung New Orleans musicians that played a major role in your development? Uh, I would say it would probably be, uh, that's a hard question. Well, they had so many musicians in New yeah, Orleans. I know. Like Wallace Davenport, I would say, people like your dad, Wendell Brunius, I would say uh, many people in New Orleans. Uh, I would say many people in New Orleans. Wow, man. Of course. I mean, and that's, a, that's just too many names to, to mention. I mean, it's just like the yeah. entire influence of New Orleans musicians and artists and educators is just... And you know, when we say unsung heroes in, uh, in, in New Orleans, you might be unsung, but when we really travel and go out into the world, people really celebrate the music and the person who That's planned. Right. And the people really, and especially the Japanese and the Europeans, oh, man. They, they know everything about the musician and the man. And they know more about the family too. Oh yeah, listen, you know, I've, I've lived overseas and, and yeah. even traveling to all these different places. And every time I say I'm from New Orleans, an entire conversation starts. Absolutely, the whole thing came. I'm so proud, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So who, what, are, what are some of the places that you've toured? I know you mentioned Milan uh, and you mentioned- toured, Yeah, I toured all over the, uh, we toured Dubai, Kuwait, we toured Europe, we played in France, Finland, uh, Spain, Germany. Uh, we played in Belgium, we played in Italy, France. We played in, uh, even played in Morocco and Marrakesh. We played mm -hmm. in, uh, we played in all the states in America. We played in uh, Mexico. We played in, uh, we played in many places around the world. What would you say was like one of your fondest memories or, or a wow moment that you had performing, whether it was in New Orleans, whether it was internationally, did something happen to you that just like, oh man, I can't believe I'm here. Uh, it probably would be in France, uh, probably Germany, Munich or something like that. But the thing about it, the feeling we get that I get is playing in New Orleans for that crowd in the second line. That's mm -hmm. the feeling that I always want to capture that, that big time feeling from the second line when we got that crowd popping and then people is jumping and dancing. We can never duplicate that feeling. No way. Only in New Orleans on the street at that time in the second line. And that's the feeling I capture yes. every time I play my horn. I'm thinking that New Orleans second line feeling. That I'm out there in the street with the people of New Orleans. That's, right. that's the feeling I'm after every time I play. Now look, you and I both know what that feels like because we're from yeah. New Orleans. We lived it. But let's let's share, I want you to share with people who are not from New Orleans and even those yeah. who have visited, but then those who have never visited our wonderful city, to explain to them what that feels like and what it means and what it does. Oh, that feeling and the emotions when you get that feeling, when you're out there in the street in a 99 degree temperature and everybody out there with an umbrella or a handshaker and everybody got their, their ice chests, they're serving beer, they're serving water, and people got their barbecue grills on the back of their trucks, and people yeah. are out there dancing. Like you never see nowhere in the world, people with barbecue grills riding around town after the second line, and everybody is enjoying themselves and dancing, and that's the feeling we got here in New Orleans. It is, and I can I can vouch for that. I mean, it's it's something that makes you appreciate us, our culture, yeah. um, what we believe. It don't even matter who you are and where you come from. You know what 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 part of town you're from, but when you hear that beat, and you get that beat is driving. Oh man, that beat! And then and then the fact you got these families, everybody ends up being hey neighbor. You know, yeah. we literally. Yeah. Uh, are in, enjoying our neighbors and the beauty of our spirits together, yeah. you know. Yeah. So it's it's that, an that spicy experience. personality we got here. Oh yeah, oh yeah. yeah. You know, um, 
you mentioned my father earlier, and I always, I always ask this question. Could you share yeah. with me when you met my dad and what were some of the fondest memories you may have had? Well, when I met your dad, I must have was, I was very young when I met your dad. But they used to have the concerts in Armstrong Park when they first opened the park. And your dad used to be playing with people like, uh, I think it was uh, the Armwood Brass Band and a few bands like that, I think. And it was, uh, and I always knew, because the musicians used to always talk about him. Harry Nance used to always tell me about him. And I know he lived in New York for a lot of years. And so I remembered him playing the trumpet with the band here in New Orleans. And it just sounded so good. And the way he was playing, and it, I just fell in love with his playing. And then I got to meet him and hang out with him years later. And it was always something, yeah. Yeah, definitely, man. Definitely. And Renee told me y'all was kin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because my cousin, Renee, lived right, right, right near you, so. Yeah, she lived right. right next door to the place called the Little People's Place. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Rich history, man. Rich history. Appreciate yeah. it. What's on the horizon for you, James? Well, I'm, uh, I got a new video we just cut in the Treme. I got a new book out. It's called Born in the Treme. And I got a few, I got an album going to come out too. It's all going to be called Born in the Treme. Hmm. So I'm going to be working at Probably this year, next year, everything gonna come out this year. And we'll be working that till we get it out there and the people will start enjoying that. Oh, I'm looking forward Plus, to it. Whenever we get back to traveling, I will be traveling back to Europe. Oh man, I can't wait to see that. Yeah, I can't wait. Well, I ain't been nowhere since we, since uh, six months I was over in Europe and I was on the book tour because I have a new book called Born in the Treme. Mm -hmm. And this book is in French and English. Wow. And so I was over there promoting this book, and then we get the call that is they going they going to shut it down and close the border. So you got one more day to get back. So I come back, and I've been back in New Orleans ever since. Well, it, look, we'll be getting back to rolling again, and I'm looking forward to reading it and and and, and following you. In the yeah. Series. Nice. What what type of advice Absolutely. do you give to young people, James? To, to young people. Yeah. What well, I would say. Uh, I would say whatever you like, whatever you get into, enjoy it and just be the best with, be the best at what you can be and do it your best. Exactly, exactly. Important. And enjoy it, yeah. So you got that horn in your hand for a reason. I mean, you know. Yeah, and this is the book. Let me see. Oh, wait, let me see. Oh, man, that's a nice cover. Who, who did the illustration? It's really nice. I love that. Oh, I love that. In France. Yeah, and it's uh, born in the trim man. Oh, man. And this is me when I was growing up as a kid when I was tap dancing. And it's got so much history about me and my family, too. And we got so much stuff about the trim man and the yeah, second line. Play it and, really nicely. I love it. I got to get a, I got to yes. make sure. So where can I purchase a copy? And where can other people purchase copies? Oh, we got it at the New Orleans uh, Music, the Louisiana Music Factory. Is and it this online, is too? grandfather and this is my grand my grandmother brother playing with Fats Domino wow. and this is my other brother Prince Lala and this is me tap dancing in the streets of New Orleans Man. and I'm telling the story about and this is a picture when Nicholas Payton was playing with us in Jackson Square. Wow look at that. And he was young then. Can we purchase it online too? Uh, no it's not online right now. Okay. And that's me in the second line playing Uncle Lionel Baptiste bass drum. Bring it, up, bring it over a little bit more. Okay. Yeah. Oh, wow, man. Look at that. That's some serious history. Yeah, so we didn't put it online yet, but we will. But we have it at the uh, Louisiana Music Factory. I am definitely going to get a copy of that. I'm definitely yeah. Gonna one. I, I think it's, uh, I like the illustration. It's a lot of history. It's important. Um, man, that's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. You have it's no I did it myself. Say it again. Tell, I did it myself to tell the story of my uh, of my trim, my trim head. That's why I say born in a trim head. That's and right. we have it in French and English. I think that's important. That's important. Yeah. You, you about to blow that horn or something for me, homie? Yeah, I'll play a little bit for you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I 
it's New Orleans. That's a New Orleans song. Of course, it's Emma. my New Orleans, homie. Man, that's yeah. James. I, I, I got to tell you, man, I really, um, you know, it's good seeing you again. And I, and I appreciate you so much. I appreciate um, you being you. You know, I want to thank yeah. you for always keeping it real. As long as I've known you, you have always kept it real. Um, yeah. I want to thank you for staying true to your purpose and to our culture. Um, thank you for being a mentor, a mentee, and an inspiration to myself and so many others. And, and I appreciate you and your family's contributions. I really do. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. So until next time, everyone, this has been Anything and Everything, and we have had the amazing Mr. James 12 Andrews. Thank you. See you next New time. Orleans. Come down to New Orleans. We oh, open. Yeah, for y'all. Come down to New Orleans. Open for business someday. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. We always open for business. Yeah. Yes, indeed. The best.